And Governor Chris Sununu is here this morning, and as always, we want to maximize our time with him, so let's get to it. Thanks, for, Governor, for joining us here Absolutely. in the studio. We appreciate it. So uh, this Supreme Court draft opinion on abortion uh, may not roll back Roe v. Wade all the way. It's a draft. It may not be the final opinion, but it looks like we're headed for a post-Roe world. Of course, last year you signed into law restrictions on abortion. Uh, some of those uh, restrictions you disagreed with, but you signed them anyway, essentially the criminalizing of the procedure after 24 weeks, uh, the lack of exceptions uh, for rape or incest. Uh, in part, uh, your willingness to bargain on that uh, upset a lot of pro-choice people, and that's part of why they said you can't be trusted on this issue. So what assurances can you provide that something similar like that, like a bargain like that, won't happen in the future? Well, again, uh, that was put into the, the budget, so we weren't going to shut down, you know, veto the budget and shut down state government uh, over that provision, even though it was uh, clearly much more strict than, than what I was looking for. Uh, like most Americans, I agree that there should be some restrictions and provisions in those later months of 7, 8, and 9, and that's a very common uh, approach there. But there were certain, uh, it went a little far in certain areas with um, uh, other restrictions that were there that we worked hard at. I made a commitment to say we were going to help fix this, and we did. And uh, I think it's House Bill 1609. Uh, should hit my desk. Uh, I think it's passed, and it should hit my desk soon, and we'll sign it, uh, providing a lot of those flexibilities. So I think my position on this and my approach on this is very similar to most Americans, frankly. Um, it's just, it's being reasonable on, on one side of it and making sure that, you know, with the legislative process, you have to give a little to get a little sometimes. And um, obviously, out of Washington, it's it's very chaotic. It is. Uh, there's the, you know, how did the leak happen and why did it happen? I mean, I th we tend to really think that the Supreme Court is above that type of uh, petty political stuff. Um, and, you know, obviously, this was an intentional leak. So I think that's where a lot of the focus is right now, making sure that they figure out how that happened, why it happened, and hopefully get that body of government back to where it needs to be, being apolitical in their decision-making process. So a lot of people see this as kind of a black and white issue, and the principles are inviolate. So, you know, if the House and the Senate do this again in 2023, they put additional restrictions on abortion into a budget that you like, that has tax cuts mm -hmm. and lots of other things that you want, will you make the same kind of compromise and over your concerns sign the budget anyway? Well, like, I, look, I, I, I guess it depends what restrictions you're talking about and where it goes and, and all of that. Um, but no, we're, I'm not looking to make any additional changes uh, in terms of our law. And, and folks need to know that if, you know, regardless of what might happen in Washington, our laws in New Hampshire do not change. Um, we still have, uh, the, the, and women have especially, uh, the freedom of choice here. That does not change here in New Hampshire. And so uh, we don't uh, automatically defer one way or the other. Our laws uh, stay where they are. And of course, you're in a unique place as a statewide elected, uh, high-profile, high pro-choice Republican. This year could be a Republican wave, and you've said before it, it's not a deal breaker for you to campaign alongside pro-life candidates. But there's this situation here where you could end up with your coattails. You know, you had ample coattails in 2020. Mm -hmm. You could sweep into office a veto-proof pro-life majority, and then what does it mean to be pro-choice? Are you still a pro-choice governor if you campaign for a pro-life veto-proof? Yeah, majority? look, this is New Hampshire, right? One one issue doesn't define us as elected officials. I don't think one issue defines us as a state. I think the issues of November are going to be on uh, the things that are the kitchen table issues, if you will. Inflation are really hitting families hard. Uh, the workforce needs in the state, we're growing. We're very economically successful and we'll likely stay two steps ahead of any recession that is going to come. But I think a, re a real recession is going to come. You want good financial managers in there. The price of fuel, energy, we've done very well staying ahead of the game here in New England in all of those areas. Uh, so it's going to take good management going forward. And we, regardless of, of you know who might get elected and who might not, um, again, there's a whole variety of issues in different parts of the state that folks vote on. Uh, as as their priorities. This isn't just a, a single vote, a single issue state when it comes to the election. So Moira O'Neill, the state's child advocate, just stepped down after four years. She recently said that uh, when she tried to engage with your office, there was silence in return. Essentially, when she sent recommendations about the child welfare mm -hmm. system, she says she received no response. Uh, we have we had multiple meetings with uh, with Miss O'Neill. Um, she served the state well in her capacity as the child advocate, and we have a new child advocate, which is great. Cassandra Sanchez uh, comes from Massachusetts. She comes from a different system. She comes with a different perspectives and ideas and opportunities. Uh, she's working very well, very closely with the state at all levels on, on a variety of issues. And as you know, child welfare is at the forefront of a lot of things we're trying to reform and tackle and redesign. And she's going to be a big part of that. I, I, uh, we've had a, a couple different interactions with her so far. Um, I think she's working very well with the advocates, very well with the folks that are on the front lines, very well with my team. Um, she's, I, I think, a great team player in that her job is to look out for the number one priority, children, and children first. 
uh, and make sure that we tease the checks and balance on our system to make sure we're doing our job. And that's, uh, that's just a great opportunity for the state to move forward. As you mentioned before, lots of bills headed to your desk. Let's go through a few of them. So the Ivermectin Standing Order Bill, uh, sign or veto? Um, I, I'm not sure where it's going to ultimately end up, but I've said very clearly I have a lot of concerns there. Uh, if you just allow uh, that to be available without any doctor supervision whatsoever, it can have very negative repercussions for pregnant women especially. So I really, really want to see where it finally ends up, but I am very concerned about it. HB 1431, the parental rights bill. In essence, uh, if a kid wanted to quietly attend an LGBTQ plus uh, meeting or club or something like that, if this became law, uh, they would, the school would have to inform their parents right away. Essentially, critics say that would put the kid in a bad position. Is this a sign sure. or a veto? Um, no, I'm not sure. I'm going to really have to look at the final language. I think that's going to committee of conference, I, I believe. Uh, and so we'll look at the final language when it gets there. How about SB 418? This is a provisional ballots bill. Uh, it's a lot narrower than it was before. It mm -hmm. only applies to people showing up on election day, registering mm -hmm. for the first time without ID. It's only a few mm -hmm. hundred. Sign or veto? Uh, so we, I know they made some changes to that bill. I know the Secretary of State is, is supportive of it. I had some initial reservations, but they did make some changes. So my sense is, unless it makes it has additional changes, is that we can move forward because it really doesn't change fundamentally change our system drastically. How about House Bill 1454? This was a big debate in the state Senate this last week. Instead of a one-size-fits-all uh, setback of 200 feet for a landfill uh, from a body of water like a river or a lake or a coastline, now you'd have to have site-specific hydrological mm -hmm. testing beforehand to make sure that that you know, the effluent from the landfill is not going to make it into the body of water. Essentially, the sidebar here is that this would sink that uh, proposed landfill in Dalton next to Forest Lake State I, Park. I, we, You've expressed some concern. Yeah. You wanted some changes if this is going to get signed. Uh, so my biggest concern on this bill, it will likely drive up property taxes on virtually every family across the state and, and uh, at a time when we're all already dealing with inflation without really, I think, having the environment benefits that were anticipated. Um, so we'll, we'll have to look at it closely, but I, I have a lot of concerns about it because it, it just it drives up costs without the big environmental win that folks were hoping how, for. How would it raise taxes? Uh, because your, the cost to dispose your everyday trash is going to go up. So essentially from the cost of that study would be passed along to the consumer once the landfill goes in is what you're saying? Uh, well yeah, if the landfill ever went in. I mean a lot of the provisions that have been put in there would, would really restrict maybe even having any landfills in the state at all ultimately which means we're, uh, you're now, we're now sending all of our trash to New York or, or places like that. That could double or triple the cost of just disposing your everyday trash. So you have to look at the, the real impact on families before you, you make those decisions and understanding we all want good environmental uh, environmental benefits but if the big bang isn't there for the massive cost that you're going to have there's got to be balance in the system we do want to ask you about some unfortunate news that came out to end the week uh, the deputy commissioner of insurance dj Betancourt, former senior policy advisor to you was arrested on a charge of simple assault domestic violence uh, we know you've had a, a zero tolerance policy on other forms of misconduct but what's your reaction here uh well I, it's my understanding that he's been placed on administrative leave um and uh, uh, you know, the family has uh, has publicly asked to, to kind of respect their privacy as they go through the, the process, and we're going to respect that. At uh, the end of this month, it's going to have been two years since the killing of George Floyd. A and there was a real moment of unity there, and, and you jumped right in on that uh, and were, uh, were quite vocal uh, from the press conferences that were going on at the time having to do with COVID. Uh, but unfortunately, some might say now we're more divided than ever. So I just want to ask you, you know, who is your closest advisor right now that's a person of color? And what can you point to that your office is doing to bridge that racial divide? My closest advisor that's a person of color? Probably my pastor, Michael. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, there's a lot of people, lots of people of color that we have both in the administration and that we lean on for advice and support in, in a variety of different ways. So I don't really think about it like that, but I, I suppose my my pastor Michael Worsley, he he, uh, you know, when I when I need good sound advice on a variety of things, I, I go to him. But it's, that's not just on, on issues like this. That's, right. that's on, on everyday issues. Right. It was such a part of the discussion, though, two years ago. What would oh, you say the governor's office is doing right now to bridge that racial divide? Well, look, I think we've made some huge steps. So if you take a step back even before the George Floyd issue, we created the, the uh, Commission on Diversity and Inclusion. We're making sure that they're out, you know, talking to, to not just amongst the capital corridor, so to say, but really talking to schools and talking to police departments and talking to a lot of different folks to, to move the ball forward. We now have a unit within the Attorney General's office on civil rights. That never even existed before with previous administrations. We created it to make sure that this a feedback response system for those who, uh, who want to understand what can be done from a, a legal perspective in terms of a variety of different standpoints, and then just making sure that we're bringing everyone together. Uh, I always say this state has to be competitive politically. It has to have um, interracial 
racial divide. It has to allow uh, uh, folks to really come together on a variety of, of, of issues that um, hit us at home, uh, can be uh, effective in our schools, that we're setting the right example for our kids and in schools. And that starts with us as adults and us as parents. And so I think just you know promoting the right message in a time of that political divide that tends to tear us apart, uh, you know, I talk a lot about how media or social media, you know, kind of exacerbates that divide. Politicians tend to hand the microphones to the extremes. We're not an extreme state, and that's not just politically. That's that's how we conduct ourselves uh, over a variety of issues: LGBTQ issues, um, uh, issues of, of uh, sexual identity, of gender, of race. It could be a variety of different things. But at the end of the day, we all need to come together on this stuff. And again, leading, I think, by example with the right positive attitude is is the biggest step we can take. Let's hit on some political topics before we wrap up. Uh, you decided not to run for U.S. Senate, but you did kind of wade into that uh, recently. Uh, you had some comments about uh, Wendy Long, who was the U.S. Senate nominee for the Republicans in New York State oh, yeah, a couple yeah, of yeah. times. Yeah. Uh, you know, you said some things that made it sound like if she gets into the U.S. Senate race here in New Hampshire, she might not be your favorite candidate. I don't even know who she is. I don't think anyone in the state knows who she is. She's a. I just know. I. I just know that she's an individual that ran for the Senate a couple times in New York. She doesn't really live here. Nobody really knows her. So to come in with a couple months and try to introduce yourself to, you know, raise a bunch of money and try to buy your way into a U.S. Senate race. That, this is New Hampshire. That's just not going to fly. When we talk about races, uh, whether or not you're trying for this, a lot of people in national media in Washington view you as a possible presidential contender in 2024. You know, with a two-year term in office in Concord, do you feel like you owe an answer to the voters of New Hampshire before November as to whether or not you're going to start looking at running for president in 20. I'm not looking to run for president. That's not that uh, other people are, are talking about that. But my my goal is to let sh make sure people understand what we've done for this state, the challenges we still have ahead of us. My focus in terms of the politics, if you will, is on uh, earning earning the people's vote in the election in, in November of 22. What happens after that? You know, I don't know. I mean, we'll see where it goes. But I, I, I don't think I'm not thinking beyond that because I might not have a job beyond that. I got to earn it. There's accountability in the system. Uh, um, you know, I think we've done some great stuff on mental health, great stuff on opioid addiction, great stuff um, on child welfare, you know, being very transparent, owning those reforms, knowing that we could have another COVID surge potentially and being very transparent with a great team on that. So it doesn't mean everything we do is perfect, but you got to go out and talk to people and, and, and earn those votes in, in November. And that's that, politically speaking, that's my only focus. So not ruling it out then for 2020. I, I, I don't rule anything out. All right. Governor Kristen Inouye, thank you so much for you joining bet. us on thank Close you. Up.